Today, the magic number that Donald Trump has been betting on for months. The AP has confirmed that Donald Trump has secured commitments from the necessary 1,237 delegates necessary to, be to become the Republican presidential nominee. You heard it there. The delegates want him, the voters too. When will the Republican Party come out and say publicly, Donald Trump, we want you too? I'm Brent Goff. This is The Day. Our country needs a truly great leader. And we need a truly great leader now. We need a leader that wrote the art of the deal. Tonight, Donald Trump closing the biggest deal of his life. He has reached the magic number of delegates needed to become the Republican Party presidential candidate. What does this mean for the convention in July? What does this mean for Hillary Clinton's strategy if she is the woman for Trump to beat in November? And when will Republican Party leaders finally embrace Donald Trump as their man? Ladies and gentlemen, I am officially running for President of the United States. And we are going to make our country great again. Well, welcome to the program, everyone. On the day, the number of Republican Party delegates on the bottom line put Donald Trump at the top of the party ticket. The Associated Press reporting today Trump now has reached the number of delegates needed to lock in the Republican Party nomination as candidate for the President of the United States. Here's what the Associated Press said earlier about that delegate count. We've had conversations with delegates in Pennsylvania, North Dakota, and a few other states who were previously unpledged who tell us that they are now committed to Donald Trump. That puts him over that necessary threshold of 1237, um, which allows the AP to call him the official presumptive Republican presidential nominee. That's right. The moment that the party has debated over, anticipated, some have even hoped for, some even dreaded, has arrived. Trump can now claim his legitimate place as the Republican candidate the voters and the delegates want. I'm joined here in the studio now by Erwin Collier from the JFK Institute of North American Studies at the Free University here in Berlin. Erwin, it's good to have you back here. I mean, you've been a valuable set of eyes and ears with us as we've watched this remarkable um, campaign and its developments. I have to ask you tonight, is there anything now that can stop Donald Trump's candidacy? I mean, has, does this kill any and all resistance? The only thing that stands between Donald Trump and uh, the nomination of his party is Donald Trump. Uh, he has this capacity to go off the deep end, but apparently there is nothing he can say that damages himself. So, uh, you know, there are people the Teflon presidents, he's someone who can shoot at will, uh, uh, say the most impossible things, and it doesn't come back to haunt him. Uh, so it's really quite a remarkable record. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the, um, the unbound delegates that have now bound themselves yeah. um, for him. We, we've got a map to show you exactly where they came from. And it's interesting just to look at the geography in the United States to see who said yes to Donald Trump. Look at it right here. We had 15 from North Dakota. Seven from Pennsylvania, two from West Virginia, two from Nevada, one from Colorado, one from New Hampshire, one from Oklahoma. Now, these delegates are not bound by the results, Irwin, of their state's primaries. How do we know that they're not going to change their mind before the convention or before November? I mean, how do we know that? We don't know that, but what we do know is California's coming up and getting over the number of uh, delegates is pretty certain for Donald Trump. And so all of these people have the choice. Uh, do they come in early and be remembered as someone who came in at the right time, or do they want to uh, uh, suffer the wrath of a candidate scorned? And I think that's basically what we're seeing now. Uh, people are trying to uh, crowd into the burning uh, theater rather than to crowd out. Uh, I mean, that's a great, that's great imagery there, trying to crowd into the burning 
um, theater. What does all of this mean for the race against Hillary Clinton tonight? Uh, this is just a day we knew this day would occur. Come. So uh, it's, it's uh, no more special than any other uh, day this week or next week. But it does mean Donald Trump is completely free to now go after Hillary Clinton. He doesn't have to waste any of his ammunition on uh, uh, the remaining Republican field. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have to trash Republicans. He doesn't have to trash talk his Republican opponents. He uh, just trash talk her. He's going to go completely on the low road and uh, we'll see how low that road can go. Well, he has. He's been pouncing on Hillary Clinton, um, especially cons um, considering this email scandal. Just uh, take a listen to what he has said in the last 24 hours about that. As I say, crooked Hillary, crooked Hillary. She's as crooked as they come. She had a little bad news today, as you know, from some reports came down weren't so good, but not so good. The inspector general's report, not good. But I want to run against Hillary, not the, I just want to run against her. Look, I don't know if you're going to be able to, it could be we're going to run against crazy Bernie. That could be. Could be crazy. Well, Hillary Clinton has already said that an internal government report on that controversial email use while she was Secretary of State will not impact her campaign. The audit found that Clinton's actions could have left sensitive material vulnerable to hackers. Take a look. Cheers, laughter, and smiles in California as Hillary Clinton campaigned with actress Jamie Lee Curtis. One reason for the atmosphere? These two men. Hillary is perfect, wrote one, using his body as a canvas. Their words of encouragement Clinton could soon need. An email scandal has caught up with her yet again. A State Department watchdog heaped criticism on Clinton for using a private email server for official business while she was Secretary of State. Officials said the move was unauthorized and a security risk. Senior State Department officials noted in, in the report uh, said they wouldn't have approved her uh, exclusive reliance on uh, a personal email to conduct official business. For my work Last year in March, Clinton said that in hindsight, too. she would Looking have done back, things differently. She hoped the matter would fade during the primary season. That was wishful thinking. Likely presidential opponent Donald Trump brought the matter up again, this Thank time you. with renewed vigor. She's as crooked as they come. She had a little bad news today, as you know, from some reports came down weren't so good, but not so good. It's it isn't leader. clear yet just who will have the last laugh. Clinton has all but locked up the Democratic nomination, but with her past coming back to haunt her, the future could prove challenging. Erwin, how important is this email report right now? Uh, this particular report is something that is written in bureaucraties, and uh, it's pretty clear other secretaries of state were also engaging in non-policy ways of communicating uh, using email. Before Hillary Clinton, Before Hillary Secretary Clinton, of State. Sure. And so what we have is, you know, it, Without showing a clear criminal intent, it's hard for me to imagine this will stick. And it's also, it's not as exciting for the uh, uh, tweeting as uh, peccadillos of one's husband. Right. That, that is a very important point, and I'm sure that we're going to get more of that as the campaign goes on as well. You mentioned um, California, and that is really the next big test. Um, Hillary Clinton is already preparing for that. She's been campaigning there today. Just take a listen to what she had to say today. Now, I want you to consider this. The only infrastructure plan Donald Trump has put forth is to build a wall, a great big wall that he claims, that he claims he can get Mexico to pay for. I think we have to keep reminding him this is not a reality TV show. The subtext there and we've heard a lot of people saying this today, is Trump has got enough delegates. He may even win in November, but the reality of being president is something he's not prepared for. Is that something that we can say tonight is definitely the case? Uh, I think the man has not thought long and hard about 
many matters of international importance of national importance. Uh, he has a businessman sense of when you can buy low and when you can sell high. And to be a successful businessman, or at least to survive as a businessman, he's got all of those instincts. But intellectual curiosity, subtlety of mind, uh, uh, attention to detail in the binders and binders that are prepared for br in briefing books. Yeah, but that's, you know, Irwin, that's something maybe you value, you know, as a professor. I'll, I'll play devil, devil's advocate sure. with you here. But, you sure. know, um, the Clintons, you know, Hillary and Bill Clinton, both once, you know, they were great friends with the Trumps. Um, and, and now everything is different. I wanted to, to think about that for a second. In the meantime, I want us to listen and watch the Jimmy Kimmel show. There was an episode on it last night. Trump was his guest. And we want you to just listen to this little exchange about the days when the Trumps and the Clintons were best buddies. In 2008, but, I want to get this right, you yeah. said you thought Hillary would make an excellent president. And yeah. as recently as 2012, you said you thought she was terrific. What did she do? Well, what let, happened? let me just explain to you. Yeah. I will, I will tell you. Uh, when I'm a businessman, I had a beautiful story recently where they said Trump is a world-class businessman. All over the world, we're doing jobs. I speak well of everybody. If people ask me about politicians, I speak well. So when they ask me about Hillary, she's wonderful. The husband, everybody's wonderful. And that's the way it is, And including contributions. They ask me for contributions, I give contributions. So you were full of <laughs> when you said it. I mean, you know, people laughing at that, of course, but it, it, it is amazing, isn't it, that how the, you know, the stripes change so quickly? Um, it's really hard to pin the man down. You know, they, they talk about people who are like chameleons and they blend in, and he's able not just to flip-flop over uh, months, uh, but in one day he can take a pro and a contra position and somehow not have to pay for the inconsistencies. Uh, so this is yeah. really quite, you know, quite remarkable in uh, Democratic uh, uh, elections, small d. Let's talk about Bernie Sanders now. Trump and Bernie Sanders both talking about debating each other, even maybe before the California primary, going one-on-one. -on -one. Now, they are both the outliers here in this. Um, you think it's a good idea? Uh, if I were Trump's advisor, I would tell him to not take the bait. Uh, he, can, he could only lose. It's hard to imagine uh, him getting anything more than points for having the courage to propose something really outlandish. But, you know, he's a, a master at staying at the top of the news cycle. Yep. I mean, uh, we'd probably be here talking about it if he did it. All right, well, I want us to take a listen now to what Trump said last night about that possibility of a debate with Bernie Sanders. I see. Okay, so he, here's the question from Bernie. He asked, Hillary Clinton backed out of an... Hillary Clinton backed out of an agreement to debate me in California before the June 7th primary. Right. Are you prepared to debate the major issues facing our largest state and the country before the California primary, yes or no? He wants to know if you will debate Yes, him. I am. How much is he going to pay me? Uh, you, you, would, you would do it for a price? What would yeah, the price be? Yeah, because if I debated him, we would have such high ratings, and I think I should give... Take that money and give it to some worthy charity, okay? So if it was done for charity... Yeah. Now, we know, ever you know, since he made that comment, um, Trump has said that he would do it for $10 million. Um, you think it's going to happen? I'd be really surprised if it would happen. Uh, but, you know, I've been surprised so many times now. Uh, I'm willing to consider even the most crazy possibility. But it just, for the political calculation, it just doesn't make too much sense. Uh, trying to get under Hillary Clinton's skin is just not worth... Is that what it was, this would be about? Oh, for, I think it's Bernie, all about... For Bernie Sanders and um, for Donald Trump, they would both be getting under her skin by exactly, doing Exactly, exactly. It's sort of an alliance here, a little coalition that they both are getting... But they're the both time. the outliers, like I sure. said earlier, though, right? That's what is so interesting about this campaign. They're not from, the, you know, the establishment. They're not from the mainstream at all. And they're, they both are doing remarkably well, even though Bernie is not going to be the official nominee. Absolutely. They, these, you know, they're drawing crowds. Uh, political life in the sense of live entertainment, when you think of the uh, uh, old political, you know, the free yeah, they, beer and... Uh, they speak to something else, Irwin, don't they? I mean, come on, people are so dissatisfied. We see that all over the West. We see that here in Europe. We see it here in Germany. Uh, it's not just the United States. I mean, these two men have really, you know, they've tapped into something. 
there's, di but they've tapped into two very different yeah. things. I think that's also very important. The, the sense of the stagnation uh, is playing a big role. But uh, with uh, Donald Trump, you know, the, we've seen this move from what was called dog whistle politics, where mm. you use code words in order to uh, uh, address certain issues involving race, ethnicity, uh, sexual orientation. Yeah. And he uses a full, you know, he uses the, f uh, the full South African vuvuzela. Yeah, yes, he does. And it doesn't bother him at all when he uses it, right? Right. Um, let me ask you um, about U.S. President Barack Obama, the man whose you know, days are numbered in the White House. Um, he is at the G7 summit right now in Japan. And at that summit, he was asked about the international attention on the campaign. Um, and he took a stab at Donald Trump. Take a listen. They are not sure how seriously to take uh, some of his pronouncements, uh, but they're rattled by him. And for good reason, because a lot of the uh, proposals that he's made uh, display either ignorance of world affairs or uh, a cavalier attitude or um, uh, an interest in uh, getting tweets and headlines instead of actually thinking through uh, what it is. Now, he is choosing his words very carefully there. Um, do you think uh, President Obama, do you think he has a reason to be worried about what the White House and the office of the president is going to be like once he leaves? Well, I think it's also for his last months in office in international relations. Now everyone is starting to hedge their bets. What could be coming down the road? And uh, that doesn't make uh, uh, the nitty gritty, the deal making in international affairs any easier for the president. I mean, it makes him even, uh, you know, the lame duck dealing with the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. um, the rest of the world is still going to be there all through the election. That's right. As you will, Erwin, and we appreciate you coming in. Erwin Collier, as always, thank you for giving us your insight and for joining me on the day. We appreciate it. It's always a pleasure. Thank you.